Good morning. It is 10-11 as you're listening to the Art Lewis Show here on 100.5 and 790 News Radio WSGW. Live from the Stone Specialist Studios, I'm Pat Johnston. Welcome to the Left of Lansing podcast with your host, Pat Johnston. A progressive insight into Michigan's political and cultural world. Welcome to episode two of The Media's Input. I am your host, James A. Paxson. To check out episode one with Jesse goldberg Strassler, who is the Lansing Lugnuts play-by-play broadcaster and the CMU Women's play-by-play broadcaster, check out the YouTube channel, James Paxson, for the last episode. But for today's episode, we have someone I worked with on the Football Friday Pigskin Prediction Prognation podcast. We probably should pick a better name next year. Probably. And he is at WSGW. He fills in for the Art Lewis Show. And he's on the morning team show every morning doing the sports and, of course, giving his commentary for anything he can. Mr. Pat Johnston, how are we doing, sir? We are doing okay. Privileged to be on with you, my friend. He's the one person in this world where I didn't decide he was going to be my mentor. He told me he was going to be my mentor when I became yeah. an intern. And that was... It was a weird, weird day, but he was just like, oh, hey, you're going to be working here, so I'm your mentor. And I'm like, Well, yeah, you don't mind being my protege whatsoever. Not at all. Not at all. And in I'm fact, in, in so fact I, believe, I believe people at our, in our office would call you Pat Jr., if I'm not mistaken. I've been called Pat Jr. at WSUW. <laughs> That's true. There, there are, are worse there. things to be called. I would prefer Pat Jr. over what most people would call me. <laughs> Probably over what Michigan fans would call me. I definitely <laughs> right. would call Michigan fans. Pat and I, over the summer, did a couple shows on filling in for Art Lewis about sports. Pat and I have talked about sports on the podcast many times. Um, later, on Friday of next week, we'll have the best sports moments ever, which I got to get to. And then a yes. couple weeks ago, we did the worst sports moments ever. So, Being a Detroit sports fan. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So these will be the happiest moments. Being a Detroit sports fan. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, let's remind everybody, too, uh, I, I will admit defeat sometimes. James did defeat me in our first season of the football pigskin prognostication podcast. I had a great year. I'm never going to have a year like that. I did. <laughs> when I tell people that, they assume I'm lying. But I had a great year. With You did. So what have you been doing during the virus? Have you picked up any new hobbies? Have you been watching any old sports? Have you... What's the main thing you've been doing since the virus started? I've been watching more YouTube videos of old sports. Okay. <laughs> what was one reason that you watched? I've been doing that and uh, reading a really big, thick book on Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg. Oh, okay. That sounds exciting good. times. Exciting times here. And, yeah, in the left of Lansing Studios. But no, um, that's pretty much what I've been doing. I still am, thankfully, unlike uh, I know millions of Americans around the uh, country. I still do have my day, my day job. I'm able, instead of going into the office uh, five days a week, I'm able to work from home in the studio for WSCW and I'm able to send my sports in and I'm able to uh, join in the conversation with uh, the fellow co-host on there. So I'm able to do a lot of stuff here in the studio, my production work that I do because I do uh, production for commercials and uh, promotions and other things. So I'm able to do that here in the studio, but I still do go drive in to Saginaw at least twi- uh, twice a week, and I host the Saturday show every other Saturday. So uh, things have changed a bit, but uh, they're still I'm still kind of keeping to the regular clock because I used to wake up at 3.30 in the morning, and guess what? I'm waking up at 4. So it's really no, no, no big change for me just yet, so I am thankful about that. But uh, again, yeah, reading that thick book on uh, Gettysburg and watching lots, lots. And it's because of that documentary that I did not watch on ESPN about that gay, about that man uh, that I will never name again. Uh, he had his own shoe company, right? He had his own shoes. I'm familiar. I'm familiar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I really did not like him when I grew up having to watch him. Um, and I heard everybody talking poorly about the bad boys of Detroit. I've been watching the 1987, 1988, 1989, and 90 Detroit Pistons videos, a lot of them. So that is just to relive those great years and to remember exactly how great of a team that was because I didn't think that they were being given their credit, especially on that documentary. Yeah, um, I watched the documentary. I have my 
long thoughts overall, but I thought it was good. I thought it was entertaining, but I think there was a little too much Isaiah Thomas uh, slander. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I think, um, you know, Michael couldn't beat the Pistons at the beginning. And for him to get six championships, he probably would have had more if it wasn't for the Detroit Piston bad boys. And I think that should have been more clear and, you know, I don't think we're ever going to be okay in this city with that he wasn't on the dream team. I don't think right. anyone is ever going to be okay with that. And that's right. So that's where those problems have come across. No, absolutely. And the uh, I think what disappoints me so much about it is that the Pistons needed the Celtics to sort of build them that, that into that championship team and the Lakers to, to a certain extent. And it didn't seem like the Bulls really wanted to admit that, uh, the, that the Pistons played that huge of a role in toughing them up and becoming a playoff season team to help them win six championships. Because I think without the Pistons, Michael Jordan probably doesn't win six championships. I, be, I think he learned how to become a more of a team player. And he also became he got into weightlifting and everything, learned how to play in that physical. Because it used to be physical back in the day, James. Not today's NBA where you can't touch anybody and everybody's launching threes from the half court. No, you had to play physical basketball back then. So there you go. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm showing my age, I know. Back in my day. <laughs> yeah, that's showing pretty much in this whole <laughs> But, yeah, I've been watching those. I was watching uh, – but I have watched uh, some old Celtics and Lakers uh, finals of the uh, from the 80s and some of the Bulls. In fact, I think I watched the Bulls and the Trailblazers of 92. I watched that series for some reason. I don't know why, but I did. Well, it, it's been entertaining. And any time there's been old sports, I've watched it. Last yeah. night, actually, I watched uh, Emmett Smith break Walter Payton's record. They had that on FS1. Oh. Nice. Um, you know, uh, that's partially, you know, my father living back home. It's, uh, he, he loved Emmett Smith. He hated the right. Cowboys, hated Deion Sanders, hated <laughs> Michael Irvin, but he liked Emmett Smith. And that's where we had it on. And he's like, yeah, turn that on. So right. it's, uh, it's kind of hard without sports, but, you know, we're surviving with older sports and everything. No, we are. And at least, you know, la last week we had on the uh, some live sports finally. I'm not a huge NASCAR fan, but I actually did watch some of the race there at Darlington. Uh, and I'm a golf fan, so I didn't mind putting on that uh, foursome match between Rory McIlroy and Dustin Johnson and Ricky Fowler. And um, I'm forgetting the other guy's name off the top of my head, but I watched some of that, too. It was just nice to, I mean, to have some live sports to watch because, James, I love – watching shows and some movies, but there's only so many shows and movies I can watch. I kind of got tired of it. Yeah. I wanted something I wanted because some of the shows and movies are predictable. You know, what's going to happen sports. Why I always love sports. And this is why I wanted to get into sports broadcasting when I was a kid is that you don't know what's going to happen. You That's might true. think you know what's going to happen, but, and, and you know what? 80% of the time it might happen that way. But 20% something's going to happen that you just did not see possible and that's something that i love about sports and that's why it's just great to have some kind of live sports back right now so speaking of when you got into this career what was the one critical moment that made you go i gotta do this i gotta be a broadcaster i gotta go into radio i have to be in the world of sports what was that one critical moment back then way back then because you were showing your age with the very physical basketball yeah yeah way 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 back then that's right yeah um uh, when did i really want to get into the business of broadcasting I, I remember getting a thirst of it probably back when i was six years old my parents got me a tape recorder for christmas and it was cool james it was really cool like you could put this tape in and I press record and my, I could, I could say something and my voice then, you know, I play it back and I could hear my voice like, Whoa, this is cool. And I listened to, obviously, you know, you listen to the radio a, a lot. Uh, I play DJ. So I would put my little recorder up to my radio. It was very, it was horribly, horribly produced, horribly produced. Would have been an E in any kind of class, but I would put the radio up and I would intro the, the song if I knew the song, you know, and then I play a little bit of it and then I would come back and do my, legendary commentary that only a six year old could really give. But that is where I think I got into thinking that maybe this whole radio thing might be for me or something in that. I didn't know, you know, media or anything like that, but I just remember thinking, I enjoy this. Um, and then growing up too in the Detroit area 
and loving the Detroit Tigers, you listen to Ernie Harwell and, and Paul Carey. You listen to those guys almost uh, at, at, at night or especially, especially I always just remember summer afternoons, everybody in their yard would have a Tiger game playing. So you would hear Ernie Harwell just echoing throughout the neighborhood. I think that's where I also picked up on it too. I loved it. Watching the Tigers too. And I would see George Kell and Al Kaline announce their games. I remember uh, getting my first microphone maybe when I was like eight or nine, and I was pretending that I was George Kell introducing the Tiger lineup and you know, doing a little play-by-play. And I would do some play-by-play watching the game turn down the, turn down the TV, and that's how I would do some of the play-by-play when I was a kid. So I think that's really when I started to want to do something in sports. However, though, when I got older, I wasn't sure if I could do play-by-play. I, just, I, I don't know why. I just I lost my confidence I think that I could really do it and I sort of so I didn't know what I wanted to do I went to CMU to get my broadcasting degree (laughs) and just to show you how aimless I I became I was like well I'm getting a broadcasting degree but I don't want to be in TV because they make you shave they make you look good you have to get into a suit and like I hate wearing suits because it makes me feel like a banker so I didn't want to do that and you have to deal with lighting And radio was pretty cool because, well, you're just in this little booth. But I didn't really want to do the sports broadcasting, and I I don't know why. I just – I didn't do any work with the college station when I was an undergrad at 91.5 because I just wasn't feeling it either. I had a lot of friends who were trying to get me to do it, but I just wasn't feeling it. And so I ended up getting my degree in film, naturally, right? Yeah, so that's – I ended up – and not make it – I remember I was telling my parents I was going to – get my degree in film theory. And they're like, so does that mean you're going to make movies? No, I'm going to write about watching movies. There's a degree in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah there is actually a, a degree in that. Um, so that's why I actually got my bachelor's then. I, and, and when I went back, when I went back, and you want to know exactly the moment, I think, that changed my life, was when uh, Dr. B.R. Smith, no longer with uh, Central Michigan, uh, retired a few years ago. But he gave me a call right after I got my uh, degree, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was applying for some newspaper and some uh, really newspaper jobs, not really radio jobs, newspaper jobs. And he gave me a call. He said, hey, um, we have this new film assistantship program starting, and there are two positions. Uh, I was wondering if you would be interested in doing it. <laughs> and I just remember saying, yes, yes, I'll, I'll do it. And he said, it comes with a stipend. All right. And we pay for the classes. All right. All right. I'll, 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 I, and wait, this means I can go back to college and not have to worry about the real world for two more years. I, I'll, I'll do that. So that is where my life changed because, because I went back for that uh, first year and I got to uh, meet a, another instructor at the time. Her name was Heather Polinsky and she was in charge of the radio station at the time. I was her GA for one of her film classes, and she said, are you sticking around for the summer? Nobody else is, but are you? I said, yeah. She goes, oh, we really need a DJ. Somebody to do some DJ work on 915 during the summertime. It'd be nice to have some live voices. Would you do it? And I said, I don't know if I can do it. She goes, you got to find radio voice. Give it a shot. So I went in, and I just remember uh, sitting down. She showed me some of the equipment and how to, you know, exactly how to run the, uh, the system. And I remember introducing my first song, and right after that, the rest was history because I fell back in love with radio, doing pretty much what I was doing when I was a six-year-old with that little tape recorder. From then on, I decided, I think I want to stick with this radio thing. So that was the moment. From the beginning of your career, uh, you've told me before that you actually used to be doing farm reports. You've done sports. You have your podcast, the Left of Lansing podcast. So you've done an unbelievably amount of interviews. Yes. <laughs> Lost oh. I, wanted to bring it, I wanted to bring it back, yes. Absolutely. Great logo. I assume you made it. Uh, no, no. A good friend of mine made that. Okay. I did. But back to my question. You've done a lot of different interviews, and filling in for Art Lewis on WSUW, he does a lot of interviews. Doing Saturday Morning Live, you've been able to do interviews, and on your podcast, you've done interviews. What do you think was the worst interview you've ever had? What do you think- My second. Was- my, my second interview ever. My oh, second really? interview ever. My very first job was at WION in Ionia. Uh, I got that job about eight months after I graduated with my master's. I was having a tough time getting any kind of radio job. I was offered a 
newspaper job in Hillsdale, but I didn't want to, didn't want to, not that I have anything against Hillsdale, it was a very nice town, but I was, um, I was kind of making my home here in Alma, and so I didn't really feel like living in Hillsdale. So um, got my first job at WION eight months later, and I was doing a lot of production work and doing some news. I was actually the news uh, director at the time. I guest hosted one of the, the there was a local show, two hour local show, uh, and they, I guest hosted one time. And my boss, this guy, had, and the, I was guest hosting for a host who'd been there for 40 years. And my boss, and remember, I'm only about 25 years old. My boss said, Pat, you're exactly what I'm looking for. And one week later, she fired that guy. And she said, I'm throwing you in. You're going to host the show. And I said, and her name was Deb Curtis. Uh, great, great, great lady. Um, and she said, uh, I, I told her, I said, Deb, you know, I've never hosted never hosted a show ever before. She goes, I think you'll be fine. You kind of, you follow things, you know what's going on. I think you can do it. Said, okay. So the first interview was fine because I got to interview somebody who was a state representative of politics up my, that was up my alley. So I said, okay, perfect. That's what I can do this. So no problem with that. Second interview was awful. And it was the one that uh, my wife, by the way, I've already mentioned her, Heather Polinski. So it's, uh, we, we later got married. Um, she actually listened to the interview. So did a couple of our friends. And it was an interview where I had to talk with the family uh, who uh, experienced tragedy in their life because their like five-year-old son passed away from cancer and they were holding some kind of, of um, fundraiser for him. And I, I, I'm not trying to make, there's no way to make this funny. And I'm just telling you my worst interview because I didn't have the chops to do an interview like that. I, I didn't, I was so uncomfortable because I didn't know exactly what to say. Right. I never experienced something like that at 25 years old. I mean, the only death I'd really experienced was from grandparents dying, but something like this. And when people are crying in the studio and, and they bring people and everybody's crying, it, that was awful. And Heather said, you know, I think, uh, I think you need to practice some more. You, you said, she said, you sounded really, uh, really bad. She said, you sounded uncomfortable. That was the thing. So I remember, I wish I had a funny story for it, James, but I don't. But it did teach me. It taught me that there's more than just asking questions. And it taught me that maybe uh, trying to understand people uh, and before you really do get to interview them would help, would help a bit. Doing research also helps, <laughs> helps, helps too, because I really didn't do a whole lot of research. I thought, oh, okay, this family's coming in to talk about this fundraiser but I didn't understand the magnitude of what that fundraiser was all about. And so I, I learned a big lesson from my, just my second interview. And from then on, I just realized you've always got to prepare, 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 prepare. That's what I always try to do uh, throughout my entire career. Well, I consider you a very good interviewer. That's why I asked the question of the worst interview you ever had. And I'm guessing you learned in that day that maybe it's hard to relate to something that you've never been through. Correct. That is correct. And, uh, and you know what, and what you should do is just step out of the way and let the people do the talking. I think I was so nervous that I, I felt like I had to keep talking, keep talking. I was talking over them with something when it comes to that delicate of a situation, a broadcaster's job, I think is to sort of act as a guide and let them tell the story and just step back and everything will be fine. Um, one of our colleagues, Art Lewis, I will say this about him. He and I disagree politically, and we've had lots of fights on the air, legendary fights. But there's one thing I think Art's very good at is it's that he knows how to guide his guests to talk about what, uh, what they want to say and make them feel comfortable. And believe it or not, I've learned, I've learned from a lot of people, but I've also learned from him too. I don't think there's anyone I've ever met, and I've been in a lot of radio studios, where the interview the interviewer makes the guest more comfortable than art in a studio. Absolutely. He walks in there and he doesn't go anything like, Hey, a bunch of people are going to hear you and you're going to mess up. Like it's not, it's the exact opposite of that. Everyone who comes in and sits at the, sits at that chair to be interviewed by art seems like they feel very comfortable. And that, exactly. that's what I will say. Art is one of the best interviewers I've ever seen ever. There's a lot of good interviewers at the alpha media Saginaw. Um, hub and at WSGW, but I'd say Art's up there for sure. He's good, and it's something that I've tried to emulate uh, as well, is that he's good at making people feel like they're not being interviewed, that they're talking to a friend. Right. That is the key. 
one of the things we've talked about already, and it's that great logo, is the Left of Lansing podcast that you've started. And I'd love to know what you're hoping to achieve um, with the podcast, because it's something where you're very passionate about sports, you're very passionate about the Democratic Party, and you're very passionate about getting the truth out. And I assume that's kind of what's going to be talked about in the podcast when it comes to the coronavirus. Right. Now, um, the reason I got this whole little project started, it was, it's just for me. It's not related to anything that I work with. It's just a, my own side project. I was just thinking, I have so much more to say, but how do I do it exactly? And uh, it was actually my wife, Heather, who said, why don't you think about just doing your own podcast? You know, get your own website. You know, and uh, just start the podcast. Well, we we can get some equipment and we can get it started, and you can talk about what you want to talk about. And I said, oh, okay, that's actually not not a bad idea. I listened to a bunch of podcasts, most of them political, just to kind of hear how people do it. And I said, I can do that. That doesn't sound like it's, it's a big issue. So I just thought this would be my time to actually focus. But it wasn't just focusing on politics. I needed an angle, and I thought maybe I'll give a progressive point of view on Michigan politics, because everybody has got the opinion when it comes to national politics. Everybody's got an opinion when it comes to Donald Trump. Everybody's got an opinion when it comes to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell and the Supreme Court and all that stuff. I thought maybe I can somehow bring it, though, home to Michigan politics, also with the goal of highlighting some of the work that progressives are doing in the state of Michigan to try to try to get their voices, to try to get power back, because for so many years, I would say that the conservatives and the Republican Party in Michigan have done a great job at basically politicking, and they know how to control the message in the media, especially local media, the Lansing media. Um, they've been able to do with the Detroit media to a certain extent, so I thought maybe one way to try to get their message out would be through a podcast, kind of bypass the old traditional media, the Tim Skubiks of the world, no, you know, no offense to Tim Skubik, but the, the Tim Skubiks of the world or the Bill Ballingers and say, you don't have to go through them to get your message out. You can go, there are other avenues, especially with people listening to more and more podcasts each and every day. Podcasts are becoming more and more popular. This is a perfect way to get the progressive message out. So that was my goal of the Left of Lansing podcast. Overall, how would you rate uh, Governor's Whitmer, excuse me, Governor Whitmer's um, handling of the virus? What do you think is one thing that you liked a lot? What do you think there's one thing that you thought she could have done better or that you didn't like? Overall, how do you think she's done so far since this well, is probably the worst pandemic we've seen in over 100 years? Right. Well, you know, I give almost every politician. No, you know what? I'll correct that. I give every politician a little bit of a break when it comes to the coronavirus outbreak, because like you said, we haven't dealt with something like this in 100 years. So I, I wasn't going to attack anybody just to attack them. And I wasn't gonna attack Republicans just because they're Republicans or Democrats because they're Democrats. This is something that we just haven't experienced in a long time. I think there was some denial, uh, especially with some governors, uh, Cuomo being one of them, a Democrat, in New York that they wanted to, I think they were hoping that, oh, this isn't going to happen, right? No, this, there's no way it's that bad. I get on Donald Trump a bit more because he had more uh, chances to, it, he, he was able to see some more evidence than the governors were able to see at the time. So that is why I attack him. And especially once the science was coming in in February and he was saying that, well, I think we get this down to zero in no time. That's when I was getting upset. When it comes to Governor Whitmer, I think that she tried to follow what the other governors were doing at first. Um, if I had one thing that I would criticize her on, you could say it, it's, it's a fair criticism, is that maybe she should have locked the state down a little sooner. She could have shown even more leadership and said, you know what, I'm not going to follow what, wait to see what Ohio does. I'm not going to wait to see what Wisconsin does or New York. You know what, I'm just going to do it right now. If that's my one criticism, maybe she should have, uh, she could have done that. However, that being said, she was just following along with what everybody else was doing. I give her credit for sticking to her guns when it came to keeping the shelter in place down this as long as, it, as, as she did. I think she gave into the pressures by opening certain portions of the state up right now. Um, but I will give her credit for 
notwithstanding the constant barrage of attacks that are happening from the presidency, from the national conservative media and from the state conservative media. And then with all of those protests that were happening, she still stood her ground. And I will give her credit for that because she was following the science. And the science has shown that shelter in place did help save lives. There's a New York Times article just came out yesterday showing that if we would have done, if we would have done, um, because I forget where the study is from right off the top of my head, but anyway, it was a study that if we would have done shelter in place back in early March, nationally, we would have saved around 37 to 40,000 lives. I think Gretchen Whitmer can still say, even let's say, let's say she loses in 2022 because of this. People just are not going to forgive her. Business groups aren't going to forgive her, and conservatives aren't going to forgive her, independents aren't going to forgive her. I think she can still go to bed at night saying, you know what, I did what I tried to save lives. And, you know, that's, that's primarily what a governor is supposed to do. Yeah, a governor is supposed to foment some kind of economic activity in the state, but I think she first and foremost was just trying to save lives and trying to stem the spread. And hey, the, the curve has gone down in Michigan big time, which is why she is slowly opening things up, especially in the UP and lower northern parts of Michigan. For the final question I have for you, let's get back to sports. And I'm probably going to ask you the hardest question that anyone's asked you recently, and that is, okay. who's the best Detroit sports team right now? Now, very obviously, <laughs> one of the worst states of Detroit sports ever. The Tigers have been awful the past couple years. But mainly, I think people are still mad at the Tigers that they never won a World Series with probably some of the best teams to never win a World Series ever. The Pistons are just in mediocre land. And they're going to be a 7, 8, 9, 10 seed for a very long time until they formally tank, which they tried to earlier this year. So maybe they are trying to tank or they find a different way to do things. And I see them trying to do something different, but I also see them doing the old stuff where it's like, you're not going anywhere either. Right. Formally just went all tank and they have Steve Eiserman. So everything looks good, but they still were in last place by a lot this past year. (laughs) And then we have the lions. I don't even need to talk about the lions. Just (laughs) from one to four, who is the best Detroit team right now where you have the most optimism that you think can win a championship and number four, you think for sure they won't win a championship anytime soon. <laughs> All right. Um, one through four. So number one would be who that's the team. I think that will win a championship the, the, the quickest above the other, right? The team you have the most optimism about. Uh, I would say the Detroit Red Wings then would be number one. Detroit Red Wings would be number one. You got Steve Eisman, of course, as the general manager. He was able to build Tampa Bay to be a perennial powerhouse each and every year so I have confidence there and they got some really good good uh they got some young players that that will be coming up here soon and they've also got you know the top pick in the draft most likely top pick in the draft coming up so I would say Steve Eisman and the Red Wings would be number one followed by uh followed by that's like a coin flip now we'll go with the Tigers maybe second maybe maybe the Tigers second um, no reason for me to really say this because the Pistons aren't showing me much really either. I just see they, they are stuck in mediocrity. That's, that's the Pistons. They are just stuck there. If you're going to be good, be good. If you're going to be bad, be bad and get that top draft pick if you can. Getting the 10th pick overall each and every year doesn't seem to be helping the Pistons a whole lot. I mean, they're getting some decent little players here or there, but it's, it's not championship caliber. And number four, the Detroit Lions. Because it's not that the Lions are the worst organization in Detroit sports right now. They might be the – they probably are the best one. Maybe. Maybe. Um, Just because they have Matthew Stafford, that would be one reason. Uh, But the Lions are the Lions. And until they win a playoff game – remember, James, I've actually seen something. You have it. I've I've seen the Lions win one playoff game. I've been alive for 44 years, one playoff game. So until I see them win another playoff game, uh, I will say that the Lions are just forever jinxed. The 60-year rebuilding program will always continue, and that's why they are in fourth place right now. Do you believe in the curse of Bobby Lane? I do. I, oh, yeah, I do. I do. And there's something else, too. I, I, <laughs> I don't necessarily think it's just Bobby Lane. It, there's something else that is just completely jinx that organization for years they sometimes will get these good young players who get injured and then they never really pan out or they'll get the greatest running back of all time 
and Barry Sanders, but never really built a good team around him. Um, or I don't know, or, you know, you watch a game and you watch like, for instance, New England Patriots, how many times did they get breaks? Yeah. Yeah. They're great. They were good teams. Don't get me wrong, but they get their breaks. You have to get lucky sometimes. You have to get a break once in a while. The Lions never get a break. They never, ever get a break. Uh, it's just funny watching them because you're thinking, there's no way that this, oh, and it's happening. It's happening again. Yeah. In fact, you know, here's, uh, I just remember when they went 0-16 in 2008, and I was talking to my dad, and he said, the league is set up now for parity. That, like, just through some the dumb luck, you're going to win one game, <laughs> and yet the Lions <laughs> found a way to, to – you know, make sure, no, no, they, they, they were going to show you that, no, there's a way that you can lose every way. And they did that. Thank you again for being on here with me. Of course. Hey, this, was a, this was a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you very much. Of course, you're my mentor, but I happen to think you're one of the greatest interviewers I've ever seen in my life. Everyone can hear you on WSGW 7090 AM and 100.5 FM. Where can people check out the Left of Lansing podcast? Oh, all they have to do is they can find it on any uh, podcasting platform, Apple Music and Spotify, blah, blah, blah. Also go to left, leftoflansing.com. And I've got an archive of all my shows right there as well. Anything coming up soon? Uh, hopefully next week. I haven't done anything the last couple of weeks, but uh, next week I am looking at uh, putting something together and hopefully interviewing a fellow progressive podcaster in Michigan. Exciting. Yes. Thank you all again for watching. Check out the YouTube channel, James Paxson. Episode three will be coming up in a couple of days. And as always, thank you to the guest, Mr. Pat Johnson. Thank you.